Welcome to this new series. I'm going to be teaching a text which is my favorite text. It's called Sefer Tanya, the book of Tanya. Now, Tanya is not a girl's name. Let me start off that way. Tanya happens to be an Aramaic word. And it's a word that appears in the Talmud and has legalistic connotations, but not for now. The book, the text that we're studying, has a very, very special history. A few centuries old, the text was compiled by the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe. Why did he compile this particular work? For many, many centuries, we had been studying the scholasticism of Talmud and other such teachings to be able to extract Jewish life, very, very important studies. But somehow or other, the soul of Jewish learning wasn't coming through. And therefore, with the rise of Hasidism, another dimension of Jewish study came into being. And that was the dimension of taking spiritual underpinnings to the more legalistic studies of the Talmud as such and Torah, generally speaking, to give it rationale from a point of view of spirituality. Not something separate, not something different, but complementary. So this text, the Sefer Tanya, was compiled for that specific purpose. It's, if you like, the handbook for understanding the nature of personality and the nature of cosmos and nature of understanding the whole world as such, God's creation, and putting it together in an intelligible format. Now, I could go on and on with an introduction, but I'm not going to. I want to get stuck straight into it. I want to add, however, that this work has a couple of other names as well. It's called Likute Amarim, which means a collection of teachings, which it is, because the Alter Rebbe first taught these orally. When I say these, they're discourses that have been formulated together to, to become a text as such, a collection of discourses, which he gave over a number of years. Another term that's used as the name of the text is Sefer Shel Benonim, the book of the intermediates. Supposedly, you could say, of the average person. And we'll find out why that subtitle also exists. So you have three names for this work. But let me get into it, because I think that's why we are coming together in order to study. So in the notes that I've distributed to you, you'll find in the opening sheet... And I'm going to be reading the Hebrew and translating. And my translation may not be exactly the same as the translation you have there on the face page. Um, but that's fine. It's going to be very, very similar. Perak Aleph, chapter 1. Tanya. We've learned in a precedent of study in the Talmud. That's what the word Tanya means. It's not a primary precedent. It's a secondary precedent. A braiso. And he says in brackets here, the source where he drew, drew it from. And this is an interesting notation about the Alter Rebbe. He claims in the introduction, which we're not reading, that nothing in this text is original with him. That he's actually compiled from many, many writers and put it together. Of course, he's being very, very modest. There's amazing original thoughts and ideas along spiritual lines that you'll be introduced to here. But where possible, he always draws a source. And in brackets here, we have in abbreviated form, the Sof Perek Gimel de Nida, at the end of chapter 3 of the Tractate of Nida. Not important for us right now. Here comes the beginning of what we're going to analyze. Mashbim Oso. We make him take an oath. Who's the him? What's the context? We'll talk about it in a moment. We make him take an oath, and the oath is to heed Sadiq. Make sure that you are a righteous person, the Al Tahi Russia, and don't be an evil person. Or in more contemporary terms, make sure you become a master, and certainly not to become a person who desecrates life itself. Now, 
the context is important. So if you were to refer back to the Talmud, where this quote comes from, you will there gain the fact that the soul, before it comes down to the here and now, in its reincarnative format, it is asked to take an oath to make sure that it does the right thing down here. That's the context for it. Okay, so on face value, that seems to be like a very nice instruction to give each one of us before we come down, remind us our duties, responsibilities, and make sure we get it right. But the next part makes it a little bit complex. Because the quote goes on and says, And even if the whole world says to you, Yes, you have made it. You're a tzaddik. You should, in your own estimate, be like a Russia, an evil individual. What's being said here? What's being said here is that even though you've worked hard, spiritually, evolved, become the perfect master, nevertheless, he's saying, in your own estimate, within your own guide, be aware that you're really like a Russia, like an evil person. And of course, this is a very, very difficult kind of statement. Why should a person have a sense of the negativity within him or her? Surely if a person has evolved and developed and worked hard and appears to have been made the status of a tzaddik, he shouldn't pull himself down, she shouldn't pull herself down and assume that that's not the case. And quite the contrary, to think that one might even be the opposite of a tzaddik. So, so far, the quote is not intelligible. I should mention that in this first half page that we're reading, it reads like a didactic Talmudic set of arguments and contradictions, very atypical to the rest of this Tanya, which we're going to be studying. Just giving you that sense that right now we're going to raise questions which raise contradictions, and then after having raised these questions, the rest of the text, yes, the hundreds of pages, becomes the answer. Let's go a little bit further. We've had one proposition so far. And the author says immediately, we have to try to understand what is being said here, because it doesn't seem to make sense. And it doesn't seem to make sense for a very, very good reason. We have another set of writings, authoritative writings, Mishnah, which contradicts us which contradicts the proposition we just made. And let me quote it to you. De Hartanon, we've learnt in a Mishnah, and he gives straight away the reference for it. It's Pirkei Avis, second chapter, Perek Beis. It says there expressly, the Altihi Rasha Bifnei Atzmecha. Never consider yourself like an evil person. Well, so we have a real contradiction of authorities. We've got a Talmudic statement that says you should consider yourself like a Russia, and now we have a Mishnaic authority that says you should not. Which one are we going to follow? Of course, we're going to resolve this later on, but he raises it by way of uh, a contradiction as such. Furthermore, he adds a bit of logic to this second statement that contradicts the first. He says, the gum im yeba in of Karasha, because should we follow the first piece of advice and consider ourselves like a Russia, like an evil person, Yaralavavoy, you'll be broken hearted, be asev, and you'll be depressed. And we won't be able to serve Hashem with joy. There's an absolute imperative. It's written in the Torah that one should serve. Hashem with joy. Now, if you have this negative self-view, you're like a Russia, how is it possible that you're going to be able to serve Hashem with joy? So he brings this piece of argument to again raise the status of the contradiction as such. You can already guess that what he's getting at in these opening sections is 
what should be our state of consciousness when we're embarking in daily on daily life in other words should we be of the mind of self criticism introspection leading to focus on our shortcomings or should we on the other hand have high self esteem and consider ourselves as accurately in terms of growth and development it's a very basic contradiction of attitudinal response to the exigencies of everyday life and he immediately raises a contradiction to the contradiction because he says the lawyer of the club is if he doesn't at all become somewhat broken hearted about his or her shortcomings then yahala valide kalus khaswasholam then a person can become very flighty in their life's attitude they don't practice introspection they don't look at their shortcomings if you don't have some self criticism growth can't take place so what which one is it do you consider yourself as having been undeveloped and therefore need to work further but in so doing you have to stare at your faults squarely and this can depress a person sometimes when they recognize their shortcomings on the other hand if you really want to evolve and grow you must do that so you can see we've got contradictions both in terms of textual contradictions the mishnah which contradicts the gemara there and we have logical contradictions so we're left in a state of ambiguity at this very very moment and this is the style of a lot of the hasidic texts especially in khabad which is to raise a verse raise contradictions to do with the verse and then spend the bulk of the discourse and this is what this is a very profound discourse in reconciling these contradictions so this is like the first little bracket that we've raised at the moment and as i said to you it's atypical it's not typical of the discussion of the rest of the of sefer tanya which really an analyzes the spirituality of the nature of life so he says i need to go and segue to something different in order to be able to provide information that we can come back to here which will then allow us to reconcile so he says acha inyan this matter will be better understood and in the english part of the translation it's we find in the gamora or the re- really however however the matter will be understood after we first look at something else we need another preliminary discussion kine matsina be gamora hey khalukos we find that in the talmud there is a statement indicating that human kind can be divided categorically into five categories what are these five categories of people a tzaddik vetovlo a tzaddik and it's good for him you could say he has a good life she has a good life as opposed to tzaddik viralo a tzaddik who it's bad for him maybe a difficult life rasha vetovlo an evil person and has a good life it's good for him rasha viralo an evil person and life is tough for him rala is bad for him or benoni and the fifth category is this word benoni which we have already enunciated as being a word in one of the three titles of this book safer shall benonim the book of the intermediate which we haven't defined we don't know what that is but here it's come up as one of the five categories of people as such So what might you have thought by this idea of tzaddik the tovle a tzaddik and everything is good for the tzaddik as opposed to tzaddik viralo a tzaddik that suffers I mean we find that in in everyday life we find such circumstances and which makes us uh, wonder about the notions of justice and the notions of reward and punishment etc so he immediately explains or pirushoi and he explains the ex- 
as follows, but Gemara in the Gemara, the Gemara explains as follows. Tzadik v'toiv loi, a tzadik, a master, a righteous person, and the good is with him, has a good life, that's the way we might interpret it at this moment, refers to tzadik gomor, a righteous person through and through and through, completely, a complete master. Tzadik v'raloi, a tzadik and things are bad for him, it's tzadik she'ena gomor. That refers to an imperfect master. Well, now we've got a contradiction in terms, don't we? What is an imperfect master? You're either a master or you're not a master. What's this idea of an imperfect master? So he brings a reference from the Kabbalah, from the Zohar. And he quotes now, Obereya Mehemna, and in that section of the Zohar, which is entitled, The Faithful Shepherd, it's the title of a particular section, Parshas Mishpatim, there in the Parsha of Mishpatim, because the Zohar itself is divided into the Sedras of the Torah as such, Pirish, he explains there something a little bit different and more profound more profound than what the Talmud's uh, definition has been. Pirish tzaddik v'raloi, what does it mean, an imperfect tzaddik, or literally, tzaddik, who has bad within him, is the way we want to learn it. Shahara sheboi kofuf latoiv. That means whatever element of negativity still exists within the spiritual corpus of this master, nevertheless is negated by the good. The good within that person is of such a preponderance that whatever imperfection that person possesses no longer has the opportunity to rear its ugly head. That's an imperfect uh, 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 master. And the perfect master presumably would be, according to the way the Zohar is explaining, someone who has no longer any residue whatsoever of imperfection within him. How that person came to be, we'll study a bit later on. Was a person born like that? Did they evolve like that? Etc. Put that aside for a moment. So the Zohar is giving us, us a much deeper understanding of what the terminology is in terms of tzaddik v'tov loy and tzaddik v'ra loy. Tzaddik v'tov loy, tzaddik, and there's good for him, we're saying is he has only good within him. There's no notion of negativity. And what we called previously the imperfect tzaddik, from the point of view of the Talmud, the Zohar is giving us a deeper understanding. It means tzaddik v'raloi, a tzaddik where there is some level of imperfection within him. You might continue and say, and that's why such a tzaddik faces challenges in life, or life is more difficult for him, because life itself becomes the opportunity for that kind of a tzaddik to evolve himself or herself by overcoming the challenge and getting rid of that residue of negativity as such. And the Gemara itself hints at this deeper implication that the Zohar has been just teaching us by quoting the following. He brings a quote from the Gemara, Sof Perek Tes, the Brachas, at the end of chapter 9 of the Tractate of Brachas. He says there, Tzadikim Yetzer Tov Shoftan. Tzadikim, righteous people, their Yetzer Tov dominate them. Rishoim Yetzer Hara Shoftan. And evil people, their negative inclination rules them. Benonim, here we come again, the word benoni. Benonim, zeva ze shoftan, both sides rule. All right, let's have a stop and think. What we're seeing here is already an understanding in the Talmudic text of the dichotomy within a human being. And this is going to be the model that becomes very basic through all the spiritual teachings that Hasidus is going to draw, especially from this text. That each one of us has two inclinations. And inclinations towards, we call Yetzirah Tov, positive, 
and an inclination called Yetzirah negative. If I can give it more specific understanding for you, because I've looked ahead, I've studied this book a few times, what we're saying is that we all possess a sense of me, I, my security, food, clothing, shelter, as Maslow articulated, etc. And this innate, built-in quest for security is part of what we call our nefesh bahamis, our, our animalistic nature. This will come up later on in discussion. And what that means is not non-animalistic in a negative way, putting down animals, but what we're saying is an instinctive drive for survival. We all possess that. But we as human beings, as distinct from animals, possess another dimension to our soul system. And that's called nefesh elokis, our godly side, which means our altruistic side, the other-centeredness. The nefesh bahamis was me-centeredness. The nefesh elokis is other-centeredness. I and other, or God as being the true other. So we are constantly the product of, he's going to describe, of a war taking place within us between these two tendencies. At an emotional level, these two tendencies express emotionally as a yetzer hatov and a yetzer hara. A tendency towards a, a positive expression in life, and that means other-centered, or an expression to a negative centeredness in, uh, centeredness in life, which is me-oriented. Did I say that wrong? We have a yetzer hatov, which is other-centered, God-centered, emotionally speaking, and a yetzer hara, which is me-centered, around my needs as such. Now remember what I said, it doesn't mean that if I take care of my needs, I'm doing something wrong. We're just seeing the dichotomy of what our tendency in life is, self-protection or giving to the other. These are the two basic uh, um, forces that dominate within us. And what he's done here is he's quoted from the Gemara and he said that in a tzaddik, whether it's a perfect tzaddik or an imperfect tzaddik, it means their yes or two, their positive disposition of altruism, of other-centeredness, dominates everything that they do. In a Russia, what do we define as a bad person, as an evil person? How do we define that? How do we cross the boundary to that? Is that they're constantly seeking self-aggrandizement at the expense of another. Whatever it might be. That's how we define the Rishoim that are complete Rishoim and the Rishoim who are not complete Rishoim. We'll have to understand what that means. What does it mean to be... We talked about an imperfect tzaddik. What about an incomplete Rasha? Someone who's not quite yet completely uh, subjugated by their evil inclination as such. And then what does it mean a Benoni? A Benoni where we say this side and that side dominate. Does that mean... 50% of the times they get it right, and 50% of the time they get it wrong. What is a Benoni? And with that, we're going to pause, and we're going to uh, say this is the part where we're going to stop right now and leave our souls so we can think about what we've just learned, and then next week we'll pick it up again. So can I encourage you, at this moment in your group, or individually, Go over what we've just learned, have a think about it, and contemplate some of the notions. The English is there to help you, and we'll go further in our next class together. Have a lovely time. Be well.